the way. And we're not talking about being in the way, as far as holding progress up, but the way. And um, we are, last week we talked about a new way. A new way, and um, I was talking to someone morning before service to talk about how that school won't be long before it starts and teacher work days, and I'm like, well, don't remind me. And I'm like, you know what, I didn't mind going back because the school was air conditioned and my home wasn't, so I could get me in the air conditioning. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, start early in August. Why don't you, let's go middle of July, but um, let me out beginning of May when my garden needs to be planted and all of that stuff. But I remember when as I taught, it seemed like every few years something new came out. Try this. Try that. It seems like the, the next person who got their doctorate degree or something, we want you to try this because this is what our study was on or something to get my degree. And I remember going through cooperative learning. And then it was Carolina Pears, a new twist. And then it was this. A new. It seems like the way to the best education in the world was just around the corner. It was something that was always old. Just put a new twist on it. But I want to tell you this, today we're talking about the way. And it's not something that's just like everything else. It is the truly the only way, and that's Jesus. And the new way Jesus came, and if you turn, have your Bibles, turn in to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to put some scriptures up here in just a moment. So if you don't have your Bible, I know I was talking with um, Steve the other day. He says, I don't take my Bible to church. I got my phone. His Bible was on his phone, and that's fine. And you notice he came up here and read you a scripture. His Bible was much smaller than mine, but the print might have been bigger. I'm not sure, but the but the the print was bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's why he only had like three letters on on the screen. So he's, that's why he's scrolling real quick so he can read. But that was one thing we did some work at my mother's, kind of remodeled her bathroom, and all three of us were there. We're like. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. And my youngest brother was doing something on the floor. And he goes, I can't read this. Here, take my glasses. So it was just really funny. But I'll tell you this, I didn't put any on the whole time. So it wasn't enough light to let somebody else do it. And nobody saw me. But it's only because I didn't bring a pair. I wasn't going to ask you to see But the way, a new way, Jesus came as, as the way in, in a world that was based upon a system of sacrifices and feasts and festivals and following the law. And if you did right, you got right. If you did wrong, you got bad and, and all of this stuff. Jesus came to bring something that was new for the people of the world that day. So that was the new way. Today we're going to look at lighting the way. See, in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus came, and we looked at this uh, last week, he spoke about some people that at that time, a lot of them might have been looked down upon or looked at, at as outcasts, or those that are poor in spirit, those who mourn in verse 4, blessed are the meek, for those who, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are the merciful, those who are pure in heart, those who are peacemakers, and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when you're persecuted and they revile you and they say all manner of evil things against you. And it kind of went against the culture because if you were looked down upon and you were reviled and you were persecuted, you weren't always exalted. But Jesus said, yours is the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven is not heaven as we're talking about. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous. And what happened, it came when Jesus came. It's inside of us. It's in us when we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. It changes everything, and we're part of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is in us. And he says, you're part of that because of him. And today we want to start in verse 13 of that Matthew chapter 5. And it says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? 
It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He's come and he compares people who follow him to two things, salt and light. Salt and light. We're going to talk about that today, and then we're going to get into verse, verse 17 and a couple of verses at the end about the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is a new way. And he's asked us to light that way. I want us to pray one more time as we get into our message and just pray for, for Holy Spirit just to minister. I do want to say this. Um, many of you, and I've heard you talk about it, so I want to address it to the movie Song of Freedom. Sound, excuse me. Sound of Freedom. Song. Sound of Freedom. I think it's a very powerful movie. And when you start to see a certain level of people really fight against it, you know it struck a nerve and it's working. And we know that the, the, the line in there that to me is so powerful, God's children are not for sale. Church, we are the children of God. We're called to be salt and light. And I'm, I've never done this before. When I was growing up, you would have never heard this. If you get a chance, see that movie. It will impact you, and it's something I think the, the, the Lord has talked about even for the ladies to maybe, for some way to get involved. But there are people that are hurting all around the world. The church needs to be the salt and the light. We're called to do that and to affect a change. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that Jesus, you came as the way. The law that people lived under is no longer, Lord, the way. You are the way, and it's by your grace through faith. Lord, I pray that you open up our hearts today so that we can receive your word. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you will touch churches all across the country today. Lord, I pray that you will touch Christians, Lord, all around the world, even those that are being persecuted. Lord, today in a special way, touch them. Lord, encourage them and give them Lord, your, your, your grace and the hope that comes through you. Lord, I pray for our government, Lord, for our country, that, Lord, that our leaders will use the wisdom that you give, and that, Lord, they'll make decisions based upon your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. And, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you will minister to every heart and every life, and that, Lord, that you will touch. And in Jesus' name, amen. He calls us to be salt and to be light. And as we read this passage in verses 13 and 14, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You are the light of the world. That you there, they, they say that that is the second person plural now. And it could be better translated for the, us, and we're not re real far south, but from the south, y'all. Y'all. Or the light of the world. Y'all are the salt of the earth. It, it means us, not just you individually, you, it means you individually, but just not the, the disciples. It means all of us and all of us believers that we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And to the people that he would have been talking to, to look at them, the meek, those who are being persecuted, those who are hungry and thirsty, he's saying, you know what? You're the salt. You're the light. And what he's doing is taking it out of just the religious people and saying, you know what? It's for everybody to be the salt and the light. You say, well, I'm not a pastor. You're right. That's fine. I'm not what you are. But we're all called to be salt and to be light. We're all got a calling upon our lives. So what is the significance of salt? And of light. Well, let's look at salt first. Salt, and, and for many years and many cultures, has been a commodity, something that would, could be sold and traded and bartered with. The word salary comes from an ancient word meaning salt money. 
uh, referring to a Roman soldier's allowance for the purchase of salt. Someone who earns his pay is still said to be worth his salt. Salt has been also been used to express promises and, and friendship between people. It is even considered by the Greeks to be divine. Today, in many Arab countries, if two men partake of salt together, they are sworn to protect one another, even if they had previously been enemies. In the ancient world, ingesting salt was a way to make an agreement legally binding. <laughs> so instead of signing contracts, you would eat salt together. Might have been fewer contracts, but I'm not sure. Um, if two parties entered into an agreement, they would eat the salt together in presence of witnesses, and an act, and that act would bind their contract. <laughs> Even in the Bible, King Abijah, in his speech in Second Chronicles, mentioned such a salt covenant. He says, "Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt?" The Old Testament law commands the use of salt in grain offerings and makes clear that the salt of the covenant should not be missing from the grain offering. See, in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13, we're going to put this up on the screen. And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. And the Levitical priests, when they went into the promised land, all the land was divided up and given to the tribes. And then the, the priests, in order to supply, God, God promised to provide for them, but they didn't have their own land. And so they did it to the sacrifices of the people, and he called this promise of provision a salt covenant. See, salt is a valuable thing. Many of you are here today. You grew up where you would preserve different things with salt. You use salt to flavor your food. Many of you use salt. Some of you have been told not to use so much salt or use any salt. And you, you struggle and you try to find a salt substitute to flavor your food. We know that it has medicinal uses. Salt was believed to have healing properties. It was used to treat a variety of elements such as sore throats and skin conditions. We just read that in, in, the, um, in the Bible, it has a religious understanding, but it was also used in trade, and it was a commodity that was sold and, and traded for over long di distances. So it would have been a very high compliment, and even uh, unbelievable for many, for Jesus to say, you're the salt of the world, you're the salt. It would have been something that would have been something beyond them because it was so valuable and it's used it and it was highly sought after. But see, these people that would have been listened to know that they were valuable and important would have changed their life because of what how they've been looked at so many times. Instead of pushing the, these people aside, Jesus is telling them, you are needed. Today I want to tell you this. You're needed in the kingdom of God. You're the salt of the earth. See, in Mark chapter 9, it tells us this. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. And then in Colossians chapter 4, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each other see our role as believers in this world is illustrated by salt we're to hinder the spread of corruption just like salt would preserve and have medicinal purposes we're to create a thirst if you eat salt pork you're going to get a thirst and it enhances flavor we're to be a difference in the world in which we live He's called us to be the salt of the earth. And we're to make a difference. We're to make a change. We're to make an impact wherever we go because we're salt. We're salt. 
See, in Matthew, in that verse 14 of Matthew chapter 5, it says this, You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. See, if we're the salt of the earth and we're called to go out and we're making change and, and we're valuable and we know that we matter in the kingdom of God and you are important, some of you in your lives, you've never felt like you've been important, even the kingdom of God. Well, I don't do this and I don't do that. I don't teach and I don't preach. I don't sing. I don't, what, what am I? What value am I? I'm here to tell you today. If Jesus said you are salt, you're valuable. You have a purpose. There's meaning in your life. And you're to be salt wherever you go. You're going to make a difference. You're going to make a difference. But then he goes on and says, you're a light. Of the world. Now what did Jesus tell, tell us about himself? He says, I am the light of the world. And then he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they put a lamp under and put it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. He says that you're salt and that you are Light. Salt, you're to make you make the change, you're to make a difference, you're to enhance things, you're to make things better. But then he goes on and says, You're a light, you're going to shine. See the problem for many of us, we can't be light because we're too worried about the darkness. We get scared of everything that's around us. We're scared of this going to happen, and this might happen, and this is coming, and this could do, this could be happening. Our government might do this, our government might do that. This, this could occur. I'm here to tell you right now. You don't have to worry about all of that. You're the light of the world. You're to shine in the midst of all of the stuff that's going on. In the midst of all of the chaos of what's happening. You're to be light. You're like a city that's set on a hill. If you've ever been somewhere, you're just driving along and it's dark and all of a sudden you're getting close to a town or a community and you start to see the lights in, in the horizon. You say, you know what, we're getting close to something. I see the lights. He said, that's what you are. And if you're a light, you don't put it under a basket. No, you set it on a lampstand, on a table, and you let it shine for everybody to see. He says, that's who you are for too long as salt and at light. And his life, we've kept ourselves hidden. It wasn't but so many years ago, it was, well, you don't want to go in politics as a Christian, because it'll just, no, we, no, I'm here to tell you right now. We need believers in every area of life. We need believers that are doctors, believers that are cashiers. We need believers that are teachers. We need believers that, that work in, in factories. We need believers that, that do construction. We need believers in every area of life. Why? We're called to be salt. We're called to be light. We're called to make a difference. And we live in a world that needs us. They need Jesus and they see Jesus and find Jesus through us and how we shine and how we flavor and how we make a difference. Isaiah 42 verse 6 said this, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. He's talking about Jesus here. And then in Luke chapter 2, it says this, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Jesus was the light that came into the world. And when we know him, the light is in us. And we're called to be a light that shines. And we've got the light in the word. See, Psalms tells us this about the word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Jesus told us in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the word. We've got him as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. So, Pastor, I don't always know what to do. Know the word. Know Jesus. He'll shine and he'll give you direction. You, you may not hear an audible voice, but what you will feel, you'll feel that nudge, you'll feel that in, in impression. You'll, you'll find something in the Word that will give you direction. And see, as we go through our days, we can shine. 
We don't have to stay hidden. We don't have to hide. We don't have to be scared of what's going on. Why? We've got the light in us and we're light to the world. We're light to those that are around us. I'm telling you right now, don't put yourself under a basket. Pastor, what do you mean by putting myself under a basket? I don't wear a basket around. When you have a chance to be who you are in Christ, don't walk away from it. Be who you call, who, who you are in Him. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, let it be known. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You don't have to be obnoxious. But you know what? You can still shine. You can yeah. still be light. I know when I talked, I'd get at questions. On the, I, I remember one night coming back from Bath County. And that road coming back. It's hard to tell who was driving. We could have been all over it. But I had a couple of the basketball players come up and start asking me questions about the Bible and stuff about about Christ. I remember uh, one of my basketball players in AP Calculus started asking me questions. I'm like, well, give me just a second. I'll be back there. The rest of you get to work like you're supposed to be. Listen, when you get a chance to let your light shine, let it shine. The world will tell you, no, you can't take your Bible with you. Oh, yeah, you can. For too long, our students have been told, you can't say prayers. Go ahead, you can. Now, you're not going to stand up and interrupt class and do it. But if you want to pray before a test, by all means, call them some divine. You may need it for that test. You may need it. I mean, it's... And I told AP Cal because there was a whole lot of praying going on some at times. Now the problem was they were praying, they hadn't studied, so there wasn't a whole lot for the Lord to call back to remembrance. Okay? There wasn't a whole lot there. So they were they was on a on a wing in a prayer. That's what they were trying to do. I remember one time I was walking through the hallways, and one of the teachers came up and says, Mr. Philip, you don't you don't think there ought to be that going on in, or the, like the FCA or something going on. So there's not supposed to be prayer. I said, no, 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 no. We can have prayer in school. I mean, now we can't have people say this is what you've got to do. But if the students want to get together and pray, they can get together and pray. Now they can't skip class to do it, but if you want to do it before school starts, there's nothing to stop them. There's not a wall that can stop them. If they want to carry their Bibles around and like every other student does in classroom when there's downtime, if they want to read their Bible, they can read their Bible. There's nothing to stop them. See, we can be light. We don't have to leave who we are at the door anywhere. We're called to be light. Now you've got to do it the right way. Now, if you're working in a factory, don't stand up, don't go around from person to person while you're supposed to be watching the chocolate come by and start trying to witness, you will get in trouble. But you know what? If someone needs prayer and they come to you, you say, you know what? You're in break time. Won't you see me? We'll, we'll have prayer together. We are who we are. And for too long, we've walked away from here. I thought we had to leave it at the door. No, we don't have to. But we got to do it the right way. But Jesus said, you know what? You're a light. You don't put your light under a basket. You've got the word, which is a light into your your path and light into your feet. And he said about it goes on and says, I'll hide the word of God in my heart. We gotta let it in and let the light shine because of who we are. And see what it does, it shines and it touches others. You know those people that you know that are lost, they don't know what's going on in their life. They're facing things, they don't have any clue what to do. And you've got the answer. What's that answer? Jesus. Jesus, you've got the answer. You know that the average Christian is more likely to tell people about a good restaurant than they are about a good Savior. Think about it. And I'm just going to challenge you. How many times have you told somebody about Jesus? How many times have you told them about a restaurant you've been to? 
See, all I'm all I'm wanting to share with you is this: be a light. I don't want. I don't, I'm not here to condemn you. I mean, there's been times I've been quiet. I'll be honest. I'm like you. Sometimes it just seems easier. But we're called to be salt. We're called to be light. We're called to be who we are in Christ. If you have your Bibles, go to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to come back to Matthew 5. So if you have a couple fingers, put one there. Most of you here, I think, have 10. You may want to keep your spot there. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse 12. Just one of you. We're going to put them up also. Oh, just a little side note. I remember we were um, talking about um, Steve having a Bible on his phone. I'd have loved to have that grown up because we used to go out and spend a week with my aunt when my mom and dad would go to our international church convention. And we'd go out there, and on Thursday night they had something where they do call it Scripture Scramble, where you'd pull your Bible out and they'd read a scripture off. They'd say, Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. And you had to get there real quick. And if you didn't bring your own Bible that you were used to reading, you had to borrow one, you never won. You never got it. <laughs> but now if you had your little, the little Bible app, there it is. Just read it off. You have to put in new rules now. But in <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, that you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So he says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. See, what God has done in you, what you do is you bring out around others. And he's called, and he says, it says that you become blameless and harmless children of God in the midst of a what? Crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights. Your lights. That's who you are. I'm sitting in a room full of lights. Lights that shine in the midst of a world that's full of darkness and confusion and chaos. And, and we mentioned the Sound of Freedom, the movie, the, the child trafficking and, and the pornography, you know, the children pornography. And now they're trying to say that, you know what, they're not pedophiles. They're just, um, oh, what's that, um, minor attracted. Can't call them pedophiles anymore because that's a demeaning term and it could hurt somebody. It could cause confusion. They're just minor attracted. We live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, but he's called you to be what? Light. Your light. You shine for him. Let point people to where? Not to doctrine, not to all of the other stuff, but to Jesus as the answer. He's the answer for the light. We call to point people to Jesus, cling to Jesus, shine the light of the, of the gospel, for you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus is calling us to be to have an influence in the world and to share the message of salvation with others through our words and our actions. So just a couple questions. Where can you shine this week? I actually give that to you on your back of your sheet on the Go Greater Challenge. How can you shine your light this week? Where can you encourage others in the gospel? Where can you love others like Jesus has loved? Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 once again. If you're back there, verse 17. Let's finish with this. Verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I want to tell you this. The law was good and holy. It still is. But here's the problem with the law, the Mosaic law. It had no power to make you good and holy. 
I mean, say, well, Pastor, why do we have to know the Old Testament? Well, the Old Testament is all about Jesus. It is Jesus. It points us to Jesus. The law was good and holy. It told us how holy God was and how holy he wanted us to be, but gave us no power to be there. So let's go to verse 18. For I surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle, one little line, one little mark will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Who fulfilled the law? Jesus did. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be, be called least in the kingdom of God. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So as God said, I want you to be the salt and the light. The salt and the light were to shine and, and, and show people Jesus. And here he says, but you know what? The law, it was good and holy, but it had no power to make you that. So I came to fulfill the law. So we don't live by the law. We live through grace by faith in Christ. But you know what happens as we do that? The law is fulfilled. The law is fulfilled because it's fulfilled in Jesus. And who's in us and who do we live in? It's Jesus. The law has no power. Now there are people who still say, you know what? Pastor, you have to live by the Ten Commandments. No, I don't. I live in Christ. And you know what happens? When I live in Christ, I go beyond what the law said. What do you mean? The law said, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know what happens now through the Spirit? He's, Jesus said, if you even look at a woman and you lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Oh, that takes you to a whole different level. The Bible says, thou shalt not murder. But then Jesus said, you know what? If you... If you get angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. See, what happens, what the, we couldn't do under the law, the simple things, just don't commit adultery. He says, now I give you power that you won't even look and lust. Because that's adultery in the heart. See, because of Jesus, in a world that's crooked and perverse, we say, well, how do we understand all of this? How do we, how do we handle all this? He says, you know what? You can't do it on your own by trying to be good. You can do it through me. That's why I want you to shine your light for everyone to see. There are people today struggling with stuff that they can't fix. And they're trying to fix it and they'll never fix it until they let Jesus come into their life. And he changes everything and the power of Holy Spirit gives them the power to live. See, we keep trying to tell them, don't, don't, don't. We don't give them anything that says... This is the power to do in Jesus. See, Jesus that came to give us what? Life and life more abundantly. But if we keep trying to don't, 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 don't. If, how, how many hate when people keep telling you, don't do that, don't do that. Stop it. Just stop it. How many likes people say, hey, go do that. You, you have, go, go, go do it. Go do it. Yeah. See, that's what Jesus said. You go do why well, I've given you a Holy Spirit to lead you the right direction. He's the power in you that will help you. We can't go back to the law. Why? We're salt and we're light. People need salt and we're light. That's Jesus. It doesn't come through the law. It's through Jesus. Through who he is. I want to challenge you this week to be salt and light. Let me read you this little thing. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be a rabbi. You don't have to have Greek or Hebrew training. Jesus is calling each of us, the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the hungry, the thirsty, the persecuted, and others. He's calling all of us. Shine your light and let the gospel reflect through your life. You're the salt of the earth. And what will happen as you salt and as you shine? I don't know if that's actually a verb, you salt. As you salt, and as you shine, you'll leave people to Jesus and they're going to wonder what's different about you. They're going to want to know what's going on in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. Thank you for your blessing, your love, your care. And Lord, we just ask that you'll minister to every heart and every life. Lord, we're salt and we're light. When we know you, we make a difference wherever we go. 
we're called to make a difference. Sometimes, Lord, we like to put just, just hide. Sometimes we like to be under that basket, as your scripture says. Sometimes we just like to just blend in the background. Well, Lord, even in that, you can use us. You will bring people to us. You will lead us to people. And Lord, we can touch them. And Lord, we can see great things happen. But Lord, we're the salt. We're the light. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that you will speak to every life. Lord, there are people that each one here knows. Us, us, their circle of influence. That Lord, that these people need to know about Jesus. They need to see it through them. They need to hear it from us. Lord, let us shine. Let us flavor. Let us season. Lord, let us touch people. If your head's bowed, it's a very simple question. I ask it every week, but it's, it's the most important question you need to answer. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Have you accepted him in your life? Are you a child of God? Have you allowed this light to come into your life? <laughs> if you don't know him, I want to pray a very simple prayer today. And I want you to repeat it with me. I want you to believe it as you say it. The scripture says you shall be saved. Saved from your sin. Saved from the wages of sin. Saved from an eternity in hell. Jesus said you shall be saved. We we'll ask everyone here, everyone that's watching, to pray this prayer. And if you're praying for the first time, believe it. You shall be saved. If you've prayed it before, let's just pray it together with those that we be praying for the first time. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. Based on that confession, I am saved. My sins are gone, and I'm a child of God. Thank you for changing my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand right now? I'm going to sing a chorus.